very humbled. I've been able to introduce, for the second time this year, an author to this club. The first, back in June, was astronaut Kathy Sullivan. Her book was published Thursday, just in time for your Christmas shopping. I think you will enjoy it a lot. Her book is Handprints on Hubble, An Astronaut's Story of Invention. Our speaker today is also an author. More about his book in a minute. First, his professional career. Rick is an attorney, a graduate of the Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University and the General Motors Institute. In 1987, he joined Honda of America Manufacturing as an attorney in the legal department. In 1998, he became general counsel. 2001, vice president with additional responsibilities for support services. 2004, down to Alabama with operational leadership in Honda, at Honda's manufacturing plant in Alabama. 2008, leadership at Honda of Indiana. 2011, back to Ohio. Today, Executive Vice President of Honda North America and American Honda. His responsibilities in that role are vast. Regional planning, finance, corporate communications, information services, human resources, administration, law, audit, government and industry relations. That last one includes service as a director of the National Association of Manufacturers, and he has served as chairman of the Ohio Manufacturers Association. That last responsibility meant he also had to take the lead on Honda's response to the Dakota airbag crisis probably the largest, most serious recall in the history of the American automobile industry and the one that really affected Honda. He will talk more about that. But to understand Rick's leadership when facing a crisis, you need to read his book. What Happens Next? It's his personal, intimate story of raising a son with autism. Being father to an autistic son is a huge challenge. This book is informative, it is compassionate, it is inspiring. This book gives you a much better idea of who Rick is and who he is, the person that he is, is changing the approach of the American automobile industry to its responsibility for recalls. His leadership is saving lives. Please welcome to our podium a leader in Honda, a leader in the American automobile industry, and an extraordinary father and person, Rick Shostak. Thank you, Scott. That was very, very kind of you, that warm introduction. And I know after all these years, you still have Honda Red in your blood, so I very much, very much appreciate that. Before I get started, I brought a special guest here today myself, and that is my father, Don Shostak. Dad, would you stand up and be recognized? He will turn 88 years young later this week, indeed. And Dad had a 40-plus year career with General Motors, uh, including a stint at the Fisher Guide plant that used to be on Georgesville Road uh, uh, on, the, on the west side of town. Uh, and I just hope that the genes are good to me and that I have my dad's vitality should I live to be his age. So glad to have you here, Dad. You know, Honda has a long-standing relationship with the Columbus Rotary, and through the years we've come here to share some exciting news. 
Recently, my colleague Tom Shoup spoke to you about our early strategy to expand our business in this great state and the many ways that we've really grown with Central Ohio over the past four decades. Now, this past Saturday marked my 32nd anniversary working at Honda. And just like Tom, I'm lucky to be part of Honda's Ohio story. But the Honda story I'm going to share with you today is a very serious topic with implications for anyone who owns an automobile, either now or into the future. I want to share with you that very challenging situation that Honda has been working to address here in the U.S. and also in other regions of the world for the last five years, and that is the recall and repair of defective Takata airbag inflators. Of course, ironically, these parts were originally installed in millions of our vehicles to ensure the safety of our customers. Now, before I get started here, a note of caution. This presentation that I'm going to give to you today contains some graphic images that I want you to understand we've included with permission because they really are central to understanding this issue. And while the problem that led us to this crisis didn't begin here, the story did start on September 11, 2014, when Honda found itself in the eye of the storm with the publication of this story in the New York Times. It was a story that publicly linked Honda to Takata, a supplier that produced defective airbag inflators that had already killed three of our customers. And saying those words always gives me pause, because it's never lost on anyone at Honda that since that story appeared, another 11 people in the United States have lost their lives, and more than 200 have been injured due to the rupture of Takata inflators. So first and foremost, our thoughts and our prayers remain with the victims and their families. Our number one priority as a company is to protect our customers. Following the New York Times story, a subsequent piece on the CBS Evening News a few days later introduced us to one of the victims of a Takata inflator rupture. A survivor and a remarkable young woman, Air Force Lieutenant Stephanie Erdman. I'll share more about Stephanie in a moment, but here's an excerpt from that CBS report. Tonight, CBS News is investigating one of the largest auto recalls in history. 11 million vehicles whose airbags can cause serious injuries. Jeff Glor met one of the victims. It is going to be Stephanie Erdman's life changed forever in September of last year. She was involved in a collision in this Honda Civic in Destin, Florida. Instead of an airbag saving her, it nearly killed her. Instant blindness on my right side, followed by gushing blood. Uh, it's terrifying. Yeah, I, I thought I was going to bleed out at first. The airbag exploded and sent shrapnel into her face. When you see the picture, some people wonder how you survived that. Yes. Do you wonder how you survived? Absolutely. I'm, I was one of the lucky ones. Stephanie Erdman has spent the past year helped by her family in and out of reconstructive surgeries. What's it been like for your family? Tough. And they, tr they try to be strong for me, and I see it. But you can tell anytime I talk about it, and I try to talk about it all the time because it helps me, that it hurts them. Erdman told us she is suing Honda. Honda would not comment on her case, but told us our hearts and sympathies go out to the individuals and families who've been affected. If a recall is necessary, we act swiftly and without hesitation. So in just a matter of days, Honda was firmly in the eye of a hurricane of what would become an unprecedented industry crisis. And as Scott just mentioned, it's the largest safety risk, uh, recall in the history of the U.S. automobile industry. Now, one thing I've learned through my many years of working at an engineering-based company like Honda is to make sure that the facts are clear for common understanding. So permit me to share a little bit of Airbag 101. After decades of debate, the federal government mandated that automakers equip our vehicles with airbags to protect occupants during a collision. Inflating an airbag involves first a spark, which ignites a chemical propellant that oxidizes in milliseconds 
and the gas from that reaction is what inflates the airbag. On the right-hand side of the screen is an actual driver's side inflator. It's about the size and shape of a hockey puck, and it's inside the steering wheel. The left of the slide shows a cross-section so you can see what's inside of the inflator. Now, different chemicals have been used as the propellant over the years, and while this gets a little bit arcane, it's at the heart of the matter. Takata chose to use a chemical compound called ammonium nitrate. Later analysis concluded that the inflator design failed to keep out humidity, which over time caused material within the inflator to degrade. The degraded aluminum nitrate burns too fast, and rather than protecting the customer, results in a rupture or bursting of the metal inflator casing, literally sending shards of metal, much like shrapnel, into the cabin. Now please note, this only happens when there is an accident and a reason for the airbag to deploy. It won't happen during normal use of the vehicle. As I mentioned earlier, the size and magnitude of this situation was not known until many years later. Now we had begun recalling some Takata inflators in 2008, well before the New York Times story. But when the industry later understood the scope of the problem, the Takata inflator recall grew to affect 19 different automobile brands and over 41 million vehicles. That's basically one of every six vehicles on the roads in the United States today. And Honda was the first to adopt this type of Takata airbag, so we have the most affected vehicles. And to date, we've repaired about 15 million inflators. One of the biggest challenges for us is that being the early adopter also means we have more older vehicles with Takata inflators. An engineering analysis found that the greatest risk is with older vehicles that were also from the early production of inflators that also had a manufacturing defect. So they had a design defect and also a manufacturing defect. And there are about 1.1 million of these. They're, the so-called alpha inflators are the most dangerous. And they account for two-thirds of the 243 ruptures that have occurred in our vehicles. In hot and humid areas of the south, they show a rupture rate as high as 50%. So in a crash, there's a one in two chance that this type of Takata inflator will rupture. We've been loud and clear to the government and to our customers that these vehicles should not be driven except to a dealer for a repair. And this message is working. We've replaced or accounted for all but 22,000 of these 1.1 million alpha inflators. That's a 98% completion rate. So what did we do? We began with a company characteristic most valuable during any crisis situation, and that is a corporate culture guided by our strong customer-centered philosophy and core values that support it. The starting point was that we were going to do right by our customers. Before the facts of how our vehicles came to be equipped with these Takata inflators became evident, there was a lot of finger pointing and blaming. But even as we worked to defend our brand, the most critical objective has always been to work as hard as we can to get every inflator off the road. For example, starting in late 2014, we worked to secure a large supply of replacement inflators from alternative suppliers other than Takata. Even to this day, you still see stories about customers for some automotive brands being unable to get their re inflator replaced due to lack of supply. The quick action we took ensured that we had no significant parts-related delay. Acting quickly was important, so we pulled together a cross-functional team of several disciplines. We met daily to attack this situation. In fact, we met each morning for the better part of three years. All the while, never losing sight of the fact that our review of the number of vehicles to be repaired or the number of ruptures that had occurred, these were not simply numbers on a piece of paper, but lives that had been changed forever. This became poignantly clear during the early stages of this crisis as I was asked to testify four times before two different Senate and House committees about the Takata crisis. The most challenging of these experiences was the first time I testified before a U.S. Senate committee, side by side with executives from Takata and Fiat Chrysler. 
We knew going in that there was a very real risk of guilt by our association to Takata. Also testifying that day was the injured victim we had seen one month earlier in that CBS News story, Ms. Stephanie Erdman. Here's a look at the CBS News coverage of her congressional testimony. Today, for the first time, Japan's Takata Corporation faced questions from Congress about its defective airbags. At least six deaths are linked to the airbags, which can explode, sending metal shards flying. Jeff Glor is following this. Air Force Lieutenant Stephanie Erdman was today's opening witness. She first told us her story in September and came to Washington, she said, to be a voice for those who've been silenced. Erdman barely survived an airbag explosion inside a Honda Civic last year. Since that day, I've endured multiple surgeries and therapies. I have more to go still. My vision will never be the same. I will never be the same. Takata executive Hiroshi Shimizu said the company was deeply sorry that airbags did not perform as they should. Senator Dean Heller of Nevada. I think there was something that was amiss in your testimony, and that was that nowhere does it say that Takata takes full responsibility. Does Takata take full responsibility for this tragic defect? The, uh, our products uh, in this accident worked uh, uh, anomalies. So that's caused the accident. From that sense, yes. Takata was pressed by Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts to fix cars in all 50 states. Do you agree or disagree with NHTSA's call for a nationwide recall, Mr. Shimozu? Senator, it's hard for me to answer yes or no, so if you allow me... It is not hard for you to answer yes or no. Lawmakers say it could be two or three years before all airbags are fixed now because not enough parts are ready. And Scott Takata acknowledged today it is still using ammonium nitrate in airbags, the compound that makes them so unstable. Jeff, thank you very much. Now, I have to say, I've been in a couple of situations in my career that have been uncomfortable, but nothing prepared me for this. As I sat before the Senate committee for the first time, it was clear from the questions I faced that many of the senators believed the initial storyline, ultimately to be proven false, that Honda had some knowledge of the defective design of the Takata inflators. But as uncomfortable as it was to face those questions, it was a moment before the hearing that will stay with me forever. I wanted the chance to speak to Stephanie. We were going to be in the same building after all. Now meeting with a victim who was about to give the testimony you just saw, well that might seem unorthodox to some, but it felt right to us. So we got our request to her in advance and she generously agreed to meet. That morning before the hearing I sat down across from her simply to tell her that I was sorry, that Honda was sorry. I saw the scar near her eye. I apologized for what had happened to her, and I promised we would do everything in our power to find recalled inflators so that others could be spared the horrible injury she had experienced. I can tell you it was a very emotional moment for us both and reflecting on it gets me right back there. Well, that was a difficult day, but not without a silver lining. Because as we were preparing to go out and testify, Stephanie told me that she wanted to help, to prevent others from having the same experience. It was the beginning of what has become a very positive relationship. For instance, shortly after the hearing, Stephanie joined me in co-authoring this commentary that appeared in automotive news and other outlets. The article, and the content of my first congressional testimony emphasized the need for a new requirement that safety recalls be addressed before owners can register their vehicles. And as I conclude my remarks today, I will explain why this is the only way to ensure that we can get every one of these defective inflators off the road. In addition, Stephanie allowed us to include her image on mailings we have sent to our customers, as well as appearing in a public service announcement we produced to encourage people to get their vehicles repaired, and more on that in a moment. 
This recall effort has been uncharted territory for Honda and our entire industry. The reality is when older model vehicles change hands, these second, third, and fourth generation owners are often unaware that their vehicle has an unrepaired and potentially deadly safety defect. Our research demonstrates this sad reality, with an 80% repair rate for newer cars falling historically to about 30% for vehicles 10 years of age or older, which, by the way, makes our 98% of alpha completion all the more impressive. Now, getting cars fixed is our responsibility, but this Takata recall is an unprecedented public safety challenge, both in its scale and in the risk to people's lives. Convincing owners who are hard to reach or hard to motivate to take action to complete the recall has required some unusual communication methods. And let me share a few of the actions we have employed. For starters, Honda has made almost 250 million individual owner outreach attempts related to these Takata recalls. This has included mailings, phone calls, emails, and text messages. We also created a dedicated airbag recall microsite. And backed by our commitment to transparency, we use this site to consistently provide the most up-to-date information for our customers, the media, and other stakeholders. If you could see the screen, I would ask you how, many of these you, how many of you have ever received one of these, or something like it, from the maker of your vehicle? It's a standard recall notice required by law. But for various reasons, some people might think it's junk mail, Many people ignore the notices. So one of the initiatives we asked Stephanie to support was a, a new customer mailing. Our idea was to use that very graphic image of Stephanie after she sustained her injury to emphasize the potential consequence of not completing the recall. Now this idea was not universally supported inside a Honda. Some felt it was too graphic. But with such high stakes, literally life or death, we decided to take this unusual approach to encourage and even to alarm our highest risk customers into replacing their Takata inflators with a new one from one of our alternate suppliers. In fact, that mailer is going out again next week to a whole nother batch of customers. It's got a special design and a danger red color and it's in multiple languages. The fact is many drivers of these older vehicles our first generation Americans. Many of them have never been to a car dealership. That's not where they buy their used car and that's not where they get their car serviced. The mailing approach has worked with many and here's one, if we had it, we could see a social post of a customer expressing shock to the point of posting it on Reddit to share the message with others, but it doesn't work with everyone. That's the Reddit post, but it doesn't work with everyone. So here's another example, and this one is from far away Dublin, Ohio. So not too long ago, my wife and I were having some work done at our house, and when I looked out on the street, I noticed that one of the workers had parked their 2001 Honda Civic. Now that's something of a pride point because there was an 18-year-old vehicle still providing good transportation to someone. But for the past several years, it's also been an alarm bell for those of us at Honda because we recognize that vehicle as one with a Takata Alpha inflator. So I took out my cell phone and using a handy app created for NHTSA that allows me to take a picture of the license plate and instantly find out whether there's an open recall, I was able to find out that this particular Civic did have an unrepaired inflator. So toward the end of the day, I approached the driver, a Latino gentleman. I could sense that he knew his vehicle was subject to a recall, but he was hesitant to get it fixed. I guaranteed him that the dealer would fix it quickly and fix it for free, and that's all the dealer would do. I gave him my business card and my cell phone number. And against my better nature, I stole a line from Will Ferrell's Anchorman. I told him I was kind of a big deal at Honda. <laughs> I was trying to give him my personal guarantee of a hassle-free experience. Well, to make a long story short, I gave his phone number and vehicle number to our customer service team. 
And a couple of weeks later, I checked back with him and learned that he did make, make it to the dealer and his car was fixed. It might seem trivial to you, but each one of these little victories feels like something to celebrate. We've tried other tactics to reach people. We initiated a multi-million dollar advertising campaign in early 2015. These full page ads, both in English and Spanish, ran in more than 120 newspapers in nine southern states, along with 30 second radio ads. But advertising has not proven an effective way to motivate owners to respond to the recall, so we turn to social media, where we can take a more targeted approach. We've run sponsored, customized Facebook posts that enable us to target specific individuals who own vehicles affected by the Takata recall. When the customer logs into Facebook, they receive a custom message regarding the recall. Then we developed the idea for public service announcement in which we asked Stephanie Erdman to share her personal and traumatic experience. And in many ways, our relationship with Stephanie symbolizes the transformation of the Takata crisis for Honda. I found her to be a woman of tremendous courage and also a woman of her word, continuing to support our efforts to reach customers. The video shoot was a deeply emotional experience for Stephanie as she relived the terrible moment of her crash on camera. We sincerely believe that her personal message has helped prevent more people from experiencing the pain and suffering that can occur when customers fail to recognize or ignore the importance of the recall. Let's take a look at her PSA. My name is Stephanie Erdman, and I want to tell you about the day my life changed forever. In September 2013, I was driving home when a vehicle pulled out in front of me. Our cars collided. The airbag deployed. But instead of protecting me, its inflator ruptured, shooting a piece of metal into my right eye. I suffered a serious injury, and my vision will never be the same. I'm lucky to be alive. Others haven't been so fortunate. I don't want this to happen to you, or your loved ones. Many car brands are affected by the Takata recalls, especially older models. That's why I urge you to go online to check if your car's Takata airbag inflator has been recalled. Just enter in your vehicle identification number, and if required, take it to an authorized dealer as soon as possible. The repair is free. Trust me, waiting even for a day could be the difference between life and death. Please, take action today. We knew the graphic image of Stephanie's injury would make some people uncomfortable, so we took steps to ensure that this strategy would be understood. We worked with the Associated Press on an exclusive story when we launched the PSA, and Stephanie and I wrote another commentary encouraging recall repairs. Overall, through social media and traditional media, we were able to get our message in front of nearly 10 million people. And we created that PSA with the idea that we would offer it free of charge to other automakers, to NHTSA, to any stakeholder willing to share this important message. However, NHTSA was concerned about the graphic image and requested a modified version without that image, so we produced a second version. Several automakers are now using the PSA. As you can see, Ford has placed it on their own airbag recall site. Honda Associates have also done a lot of grassroots, boots on the ground type of work to find these inflators. Many of our 30,000 associates in the U.S. have become deeply engaged in this effort. This includes a formal campaign initiated by a group of Honda associates to raise awareness among their own family and friends. They also created windshield cards to share with customers out in public when they discover a recalled vehicle in a shopping mall parking lot or at a grocery store. We've also combed through salvage yards nationwide to collect inflators from vehicles not in service. You may not realize that some repair shops purchase these old used airbags to repair vehicles that have been in collisions. They purchase them from junkyards. To date, we've collected over 319,000 of these defective Takata inflators to prevent them from being used as replacement parts. But get this, we had pushback from a trade group a trade group called the Automotive Recyclers Association, which claimed we weren't paying scrapyards enough for these defective inflators. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, my Honda colleagues had to peel me off the ceiling when I heard that. Remember, these are inflators that need to be destroyed, not resold. 
they have no value. They have negative value because of the risk that they pose. Am I wrong? That same trade group, they fed one of the Congress, members of Congress a question to ask me as well, so they're not on the list of my favorite uh, trade groups. We've also transformed more than 300 of our parts and service trucks into rolling billboards. These trucks cover more than 100,000 miles per day all across the country. And frequent communication with our dealers is also essential. We work to ensure our dealers check each vehicle that comes into their dealership for service, check it for open recalls, and make sure that a loaner vehicle is offered to anyone who needs it. And to reach owners of older models, we've sent teams to physically knock on owners' doors nationwide to assist them with scheduling recall repairs. In total, we've done more than 2.7 million home visits. Customers who appreciate the special attention usually meet our canvassers with smiles. But some customers couldn't be bothered, and believe it or not, there are customers who flat refuse to have their vehicles repaired, even when we offer to do the repair right there in their driveway. So as you can see, by applying our customer-focused approach to this recall challenges, we've been pulling out all the stops to find these inflators. And while we were calling, urging, and knocking on doors, it eventually came to light that Takata had falsified and manipulated test data for their inflators. This ultimately led Takata to plead guilty to criminal charges brought by the United States Department of Justice, to file for bankruptcy, and now they've gone completely out of business. I wish that the New York Times and members of Congress had understood Takata's deceptive behavior five years ago, but honestly, it wouldn't have changed our deep commitment to addressing this problem. At Honda, we're still working every day to fix this problem. Our completion percentage leads the industry, and in my mind, the hard work that we've done earns us the right to speak our mind. So here goes. You know, it's easy for a member of Congress, a consumer safety advocate, a salvage yard operator, or an insurance company executive to sit back in their chair and say, this is the automaker's responsibility. And five years ago, I would have completely agreed. But now I know that automakers can't do this alone, at least not at a pace that can ensure we protect the lives of each customer. There's an entire ecosystem supporting and, yes, profiting from the auto industry and from our customers who are at risk. And we've been working with various members of this ecosystem to have them take larger roles in the effort to ensure that safety recalls, like the Takata recall, are completed. For instance, Honda has been talking, engaging the insurance industry about Takata for several years. So why the insurance industry? Well, first of all, they own a lot of vehicles that have been totaled in collisions. We need their help to get the defective flaters out of those vehicles before they go to salvage yards or to auction houses. Second, insurance companies are in direct communication with owners, and they can, and in my humble opinion should, ensure that these customers are aware of safety recalls and that they complete them on schedule. And third, why wouldn't the insurance company be interested in safety and injury prevention? Beyond the insurers, we in the auto industry have faced resistance from many elements of this ecosystem. And some of that resistance is IT related, how to get systems to talk to each other. That's why the auto companies came together and created a recall batch lookup system. Using this tool, an organization can quickly look up the recall status of any vehicle from any OEM. The tool became available in March of 2018. And using that system, the state of New York has identified 1.6 million vehicles with open recalls, and they're notifying owners of these recalls. Frankly, I'd like to see other state BMVs and insurance companies using the batch lookup tool more extensively. Used car dealers who sell our older model vehicles also have an important role to play by checking each vehicle on their lots for recalls and ensuring it's repaired before allowing the buyer to drive it away. The millions of older model vehicles are also like, less likely to be brought to authorized dealers for repairs. Instead, they're taken to what we call independent repair facilities, or IRFs. So we've communicated directly with more than 160,000 IRFs to encourage their employees to check customer vehicles and encourage recall completion. 
So I hope you can see that we've been working with anyone and everyone in this ecosystem. But as I stand here today, I firmly believe that the ultimate fix is something called registration tie-in. At the start of my remarks, I mentioned that this issue potentially impacts everyone who owns an automobile now and in the future, and here's how. Unfortunately, as vehicles change hand multiple times, it's sometimes difficult to obtain a current address to notify the owner about a recall. And as I noted, some customers refuse to have their vehicle repaired, putting themselves and their passengers at risk. Now, Honda doesn't have the power to force anyone to fix a recalled vehicle. However, many state governments do possess that power. Recall campaign rates can achieve 100% when the law requires that repairs be completed prior to registering a vehicle. We know this works because the state of California requires that open emissions recalls be addressed before the vehicle can be registered. That's why Honda is urging state legislators and motor vehicle departments to require that all vehicles with open recalls be repaired prior to registration. We believe that a registration recall tie-in would dramatically reduce the risk of death and injury in vehicles subject to any critical safety recall, including the Takata recall. Now, I understand that for many people, including probably some of you in this room, this approach would be viewed as yet another regulation or something of, a, of an inconvenience. And I also suppose that civil liberty advocates will have their say. But isn't saving a life worth it? Australia acted quickly and already has enacted something similar. They call it a compulsory recall. Similar tie-in policies have been enacted in Japan and in Europe, and they work without creating undue stress for the customers or the BMVs. Of course, there can be process or IT challenges, but by collaborating with the state and federal governments, including the state BMVs, we believe a process could be developed that would be not overly burdensome on vehicle owners. For example, as is the practice in California, a grace period could be provided to give owners time to get the vehicle fixed. We know this is possible because others have done it successfully. But only by working together can we develop a process that ensures that all vehicles are repaired and that every driver can feel safe when they get behind the wheel. In closing, I want to ask that you please share the importance of addressing open safety recalls with your friends and families, or maybe a contractor working at your home, or really anyone driving an older model vehicle. It's easy to check it, and I urge you to check your own vehicle for open recalls. At the top of the screen, you can see how to check if you own a Honda or an Acura, and at the bottom, you can see government sites, and also you can download the app created for NHTSA that I mentioned earlier. And lastly, a postlude. I can happily report that Stephanie Erdman is doing great. She was married a few years ago and now has a toddler to go along with her important role at an Air Force base in the southeastern United States. And we continue to work together on new initiatives to save lives, and to prevent injuries. Thank you very much, and if we have time, I'm happy to take some questions. In about 2005, I had an accident with my 1997 Jeep Wrangler. I went off a slippery, snowy hillside, a place in the country. They Thing went off the hill, hit a about a 24-inch tree, and the airbags went off two of them. Uh, they worked fine. Um, I was not seriously injured; and had some bad bruises, but I had the repair of the Jeep done. Uh, it was close to being scrapped, but we repaired it because it's just a grounds vehicle now. Um, he found some <coughs> used airbags at a salvage yard and put them in. So hearing you speak today makes me very uneasy about driving a Jeep anymore. <laughs> Take it to a dealer. They can tell you if it's a, if it's a good part for that, for that vehicle. The, the other problem is there's counterfeit airbags. There are, there's a whole industry of counterfeit airbags. Honda has taken it upon himself to work state by state to get uh, selling a, a counterfeit airbag to be a, be a crime. And we've got, I think, 22 states 
to put that law on the books right now. So yeah, there's, there's counterfeit airbags, and then there's the fact that they, you know, we've had uh, accidents of a 2002 Accord that had a 2004 airbag in it and, and, a, and a rupture. So, uh, but the dealer will know if that part is, uh, is suitable for the vehicle that you're in. He can check what's in there. Yep. You can check. Check. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, this sounds like a global issue. Um, the, the company, uh, you talked about how you're, you don't want to register in the United States. You talked about how Australia did theirs. You talked about, those are, those are high industrial countries. Um, I think the people who are going to be using your cars, as you said, are third, fourth owners. But what about the cars that go out of the United States, for instance, Mexico, um, to other third world countries that use those cars? How's the challenge of that getting to those cars and cooperating with other governments? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure, sure. So right, this this Takata recall is a global is, is a global recall. There's cars in Europe. There's cars in South America. There's cars in uh, Asia that that have the, that have these uh, uh, defective inflators in them. Mexico, you're right, is a is a little different kettle of fish than the United States. We have operations in Mexico. We're at about a two thirds uh, uh, completion in in Mexico. We're 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 about 85 percent overall in the United States. We're at a, just in the mid 60s uh, for Mexico. But you have to tailor your approach to both you know, the culture and the conditions and the environment in, the, in those countries. Um, it won't surprise, I, I'm trying to make sure it's understood that especially hot and humid areas is where these th there's the most risk. It won't surprise you that Malaysia has a huge problem. And um, we've, there's been several, several ruptures and a couple of unfortunate fatalities in Malaysia as well. But again, it's up to each, uh, it's up to, we have to work with each government and in, in each culture to get these things repaired. Last, last question. I own a uh, consumer uh, firm. So we represent a lot of families and people that drive your, your vehicles. And so we'll get calls from people that um, either may have a problem, but um, helping them identify this issue, which would be uh, ancillary to whatever problem they may be call calling about would be helpful. Is there, does Honda have resources that we could publish this information on our own website and use that to help inform people? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, Nick Wilson is here from Honda and uh, Nick will be happy to speak with anyone here, as will I, and we can get you, uh, we, we, our interest is in getting this message out far and wide. We've been doing this for, for five years now and if anybody's willing to help us out, we, we want to take that offer of help, so I very much appreciate that. And I think uh, he can, Rick will stick around for a little bit longer to answer any more questions. So thank you all. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you all for coming to Rotary.